Hello, and welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today we are joined by Mr. Mark Griffith to talk about the incredible drummers of the late, great Wayne Shorter. Mark, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Bart. It's a pleasure to be here, man. I've been a fan of the podcast for a long time. Oh, thank you. I mean, your your work is incredible. I, I'll tell people up front, you are currently the editor-in-chief slash director of content at Modern Drummer, which... Holy cow, that's kind of a dream dream job. But you've been a writer for MD for a long time. Uh, you're a performer and also an educator with a ton of students. So you know what you're doing. Usually you're on the other side interviewing people. So today we're going to flip it around <laughs> and talk to you. Sure. No sweat. <laughs> yeah. So, um, well, right off the bat, before we even get into it, I just want to say that I think what you what is happening with Modern Drummer is really cool. It's still going forward. There is a man involved. Obviously, the whole team is great, but you've been writing with MD for a long time. When was the first article you wrote for Modern Drummer? I wrote the Artist on Track uh, series for Ron Spagnardi um, in the 90s. Um, oh, wow. I forget exactly what year, but but Ron um, Ron came into a gig that I was that I was on and uh, started talking to me at the bar and I didn't know who he was. And, uh, and we started talking about drums and, and he said, Hey, do you think you'd like to write for a magazine? And I said, sure. And he said, and then he introduced himself and I said, Oh, you're that guy. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> that's cool. Yeah, I mean, he was great. It's, it goes to show that you never know. And I've, I've had that with the podcast. Like you never know who's listening or you never know. It's like, be, be cool to everyone. You never know if you meet someone at a drum show or something, you never know who people are. Absolutely. You should be nice to them in general, but it, it can always help you in a business standpoint as well. Just be cool to people. I've, I've had the, I've had the good fortune to interview all of my heroes and most of the all time greats. And, um, they're all cool guys. They're all just just hardworking musicians that uh, might have had a little bit of luck here and there, and, but uh, can all play their butts off, and um, you know, are all great guys. That's uh, yeah. that's something that everyone should know. That's good to know. You know, you it's kind of that never meet your heroes kind of thing. But I think with drummers, it's a little different. We all I love don't know. drums. Yeah, yeah. I, I've heard that never meet your heroes thing a lot. I've met most of mine and gotten a chance to work with with a lot of them. And uh, man, they're great. You know, <laughs> they're great. I, I, I don't know if it's a drum thing or what. I mean, you know, you know, this drum fraternity that we've got, this, this thing that we have is is yep. pretty strong. And uh, for 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 some reason, and you know, I always think it's because we're all drummers, and we've all at some point had to bring our drums in through the kitchen, stick to the floors, walk around yep. the dishwashers, <laughs> make sure you don't you know bang into a waitress, and then load yep. out while it's snowing or raining, and you're soaking wet and sweat, and like everybody's done that. I mean, Ringo's done that, you yeah, know. Um, of course. I mean, everybody's and Elvin did it and Tony did it and Vinny did it and Weckl, you know, so I mean, yeah, it, yeah it's it's I, I think that's the thing that bonds us all together. We all know that underneath all of the the shiny stuff that some people might have to uh, to, you know, to present an Im image. Uh, yeah, we're all just hardworking drummers. Yeah. And that's yeah. Cool. it's hard to skip that that phase. Yeah, yeah. I think there's a few that have, but <laughs> yeah. most people don't know how that works. Yeah. I'm sure that's cool. They're cool too, though. You know, yeah, I mean, sure. we're all, we're all drummers. Um, sure. Speaking of that, uh, I believe a non drummer, but I want to give a big shout out and a thank you to Bob Catagliotti, uh, who wrote the drummersville book, um, and the new Orleans stuff, which he's been on the show. He got us connected, um, which, he's a big music fan and, and a, an incredible brain for this kind of stuff. And he knew that we would uh, gel well together and you'd be a great addition on the show. So thank you to Bob, Robert, Bob uh, for, for doing that. I was, I was lucky enough to interview him for his book and for the, and for the museum in new Orleans. And um, every once in a while um, through MD, I come across a book where someone sends me a book that, you know, it's more, I, I think, deserves a little bit more than just a review or a little thumbnail blurb or something like that. And that was one of them. And yeah. uh, 
So I couldn't wait to talk to Bob about how about how he wrote the book and 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 all that, and it was fantastic. Yeah. I get, I got to make it down there and see the uh, museum because it sounds like they're doing great stuff. I've been and it's incredible. I saw it in 2019 and it mm. is uh, it is well worth it. And you know, New Orleans itself, we we all know has such an amazing history that it's uh, it's it's well worth visiting. Mm-hmm. So. Um, all right, Mark. Well, today we're here to talk about uh, a great topic. We we can we connected, and then we said, "Well, what are we going to talk about?" And you said, "Let me think about it." And um, re- somewhat recently, uh, Mr. Wayne Shorter passed away, who is a jazz legend. M- maybe not like an everyday household name, like Miles Davis or something yeah. like that, but someone who's extremely impactful um, as a you know saxophonist composer. Uh, legend in the in the world of jazz and his list of drummers you said is drum history itself it um, is yes and you have had the chance to talk with uh interview some of them throughout the years so um for maybe people who've never heard of him you know i, I, mm-hmm. I let me preface this with i can't really include many musical examples if you're listening to this it gets taken down. YouTube gets it dinged for copyright sure. issues. There's problems. So go go listen on your own. I'm sure we'll name some tracks and things today, but maybe give a little description of Wayne, and then we'll get into these um, iconic drummers. Well, um, I think a lot of drummers have heard him, and a lot of musicians have heard him without yep. knowing it. He was the saxophonist um, on a session. It's the only time he played with Steely Dan, but he's on Asia. He's on the Asia oh, wow. track. It's him and Gad going back and forth on Asia. He's also the saxophonist on the Don Henley track, The End of the Innocence, that there wasn't a drummer on that track, but he plays beautifully on that. Hmm. He's been on a million Joni Mitchell records, um, uh, some soundtrack work. Um, He he played uh, on the soundtrack for Glengarry Glenn Ross with Jeff Porcaro. Wow. Um, he was also featured on the soundtrack for, um, uh, for the fugitive. Um, and cool. so, 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 so most people have heard him, but I think a lot of people don't know that they've heard him. Um, yeah. m- most people know that he, he began his professional career in, in art Blake in the art Blakey jazz messengers band. But before that, he played in Maynard Ferguson's band in 1959 with a great drummer named Frankie Dunlop, who mm-hmm. a lot who a lot of people know because he went on uh, to later play with Monk. And then most drummers relate to Wayne through the great work he did in the the great second Miles Davis quintet with Ron and Tony and Herbie and 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 that whole band from '63 to '69. Um, And then, you know, and then if and then, you know, if that wasn't enough, he co-led Weather Report for however long Weather Report was was a band. But him Mm. and Joe Zao and Yul and Miroslav Vitos Vitos um, started Weather Report in 1970. And 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 you could easily just talk about the drummers of Weather Report uh, because there was a ton of them. That's been suggested as an episode. And. It's this is kind of a uh, a new concept uh, of an episode where once you do this, I mean, we could do f- other sure. ones down the road. Well, was. the weird thing is, I'm, the weird thing is, we'll get back to the MD thing for a second. I wrote um, I wrote two pieces for MD 20 plus years ago. One was the drummers of Frank Zappa and one was the great organ drummers of all time. The uh, theme drummers that played in the organ trios and mm. um when I was working on those, I sort of, I sort of figured out in my mind, sort of a mantra saying whatever ever you want to call it, but that great drumming lives within great music, and um, yeah. and 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 then hopefully great music lives within great drumming as well. But that's all, all up to us. But um, and and I started to do this with students. I started to. Um, have them find an artist or a band or a band leader that had had a lot of different drummers in their band and studied the drums through the evolution of the gig instead of just finding drummers to like and finding drummers to to you know to dig on and transcribe and things like that and 
And, and, and amazingly, there's a lot of those bands and those band leaders, you know, Pearl Jam, you know, you can study the evolution of drums since Pearl Jam began through the drummers in that band. But, yeah. but I mean, if you want to go way back, you know, in history, you could do that through the drummers of Count Basie. You, you could read do, my mind. Yeah, yeah, you could do that through the drummers of Miles or Train or Monk or Michael Brecker or John Schofield or Chick Corea. Um, and then in and and then in rock, you know, the drummers of Jeff Beck, the drummers of Pearl Jam, the drummers of Sting, Prince, yep. Zappa, yep. whatever. So yep. so so I sort of stumbled upon that, and I use it a lot with students um, to uh, to help them. And what it does is it um, it lets you hear different drummers, different great drummers takes on the same idea. You know, it's great to hear the same drummers play, you know, the same tune. You know, you can do that yeah. with Sting. You know, it's you know, it's great to hear Sur Copeland and Omar Hakim and and Mananu and and Vinny all play the same song, you yeah. know, slightly and, different in their own and, in their and, own. Yeah. Yeah. Because, you know, because as young drummers, that's what that's what most young drummers are asked are asked to do unless we're in unless we're fortunate enough to join a great originals band or something like that. So, you know, young drummers, when they're coming up, have to interpret songs that have already been recorded, just yeah. like a lot of these great drummers have done. So why not learn from the greats that have done that? And yeah, and in really. Wayne and in Wayne's and in in Wayne's uh, case, I can't find any musician uh, in music history who's played with more of the great drummers, jazz, fusion, rock, whatever, than Wayne Shorter. He's played with everybody, um, mm. and I've had the good fortune to interview a lot of them. And whenever I had the chance, I would ask them all about working with Wayne and um, and and advice that he gave them on drumming, on music, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And if you know and if if and if you know anything about Wayne, um, he didn't speak in real straight lines. He 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 was a real sage that sort of <laughs> spoke in anecdotes and stuff like that. In fact, um, on the cover of next month's Modern Drummer. Uh, I interviewed Terry Lynn Carrington and Terry oh, man. Lynn awesome. played, played with Wayne for a lot. And we talked a lot about Wayne and, uh, and she, she explained, you know, I'll just, I'll, I'll just give, just give a little tidbit of what Please. she said. She said, yeah. you know, that Wayne and her, her be, of course, uh, those guys just play life. They don't play music. They play life on their instruments. And uh, it's a pretty unique way of, of, of saying it and seeing it. Yeah. So, um, so, and all of these guys along the way have had really great stories about Wayne. I got to meet Wayne a couple of times. I never really got to interview him. I'm sort of thankful about that. Um, because, uh, I do know he sort of speaks in a very unique way and, uh, getting him to directly, a a getting him to directly <laughs> answer a question was all, was often a little difficult. So, there's a great book out on him, uh, written by an author named Michelle Mercer. And, um, and it's a fantastic book. And when I was, and when I first heard, heard about it, I, um, I tried to reach out to her and sit and just, and just wish her good luck because I don't know how one would sit down with Wayne for a couple of days and write his life story because I mean, yeah. as, as one, as you know, as wonderful as it was, he would have to, speak in straight lines and yeah where you kind of so. want to go just like okay yeah. but can you just answer the question right exactly exactly <laughs> yeah. he was he was a wonderful you know he was a one um a wonderful uh musician and guy i happen to live in northern new jersey i'm a little north of newark new jersey and he grew up on the newark jazz scene and there's still a lot of guys on the newark jazz scene that knew him and played oh, with cool. him and whenever i heard that you know, the first thing out of my mouth was telling me about Wayne, you know, um, nice, so, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, and when I heard he died, you know, one of the first things I thought of is this, you know, because the drum, there's a Wayne shorter, you know, the drum, you know, I mean, the, 
podcast called the drum history, but you know, you know, music history is drum history. And, yes. uh, yes. And, uh, no one played more music than Wayne. No, and it makes perfect sense. And, uh, and I'm excited to get this because from you, because there really isn't like, if you type in, you know, Wayne shorter drummers, there's not too much of a definitive list. And unless you start, you know, looking at, um, album credits, it's sort of hard to piece together. So I'm excited to learn from you. But before we even start, I love what you just said, just to back up a little bit about the concept of like, take count Basie, for example, where it's almost like every drummer that comes through is a becomes a legend. I don't know if it's they were a legend before or after because they oh, went through that like boot camp. But yeah, why? And this is, again, a very broad question. But in your experience with this, what is it that makes it that there is a typical turnover with drummers in these types of groups where they go where there's there's a rotating sort of drummer after their tenure? Is it like I'm going to go to the next gig. Is it difficulty with personalities in general? I know, again, it's very broad, but what's your thoughts on that? Um, Wow. I would have to think about that. That's a great question. I, I don't know. Um, It might be different in every case. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think, I think great band leaders and I think great musicians slash band leaders are often very itchy people. Um, and, and they want to keep evolving and they, and, and sometimes, um, changing the drummer in the band is a pretty good way to, to move things forward because as we all know, the drums drive everything that happens. So, um, I mean, that might be it. Um, I, I, I don't know. I've never thought about that, but, uh, no, that's, that's a good answer. That's the first thing that comes to mind. Um, you know, so, so, so many of these legendary, you know, band leaders that we talk about are, are, are a little itchy musically and they want to keep pushing. So, you know, gotcha. clear out, you know, clear out the band every, every century or something sort of works, I guess. Yeah. And the music changes and maybe this guy's got more of that, uh, yeah. rock feel that I want to get now. Yeah. That's the seventies or something. Yeah. Uh, or, you know, they, they hear the next, they hear the next step in the next drummer and, uh, and they go from there, but that's, yeah, yeah that's, that's a real the interesting question. I've never really, I've never gone on that side of what we're talking about here to think about that. Um, yeah. But I wonder also what that, conversation is like is it awkward do you hurt their feelings to be like hey omar hakeem i'm gonna now move on and go to someone Vinny's coming back in or you're not gonna get the call on this album oh you know you what? Know? oh you know what's weird i and i was just talking to somebody about this yesterday um um i'm also a, i'm also a little bit of a sports nut um and like head and and the, like there's a saying with head coaches that they're hired to be fired you know, you know, no sure. head coach spends his entire career with one team. You know, yeah. it just doesn't happen. You know, eventually yeah. it's their job to move on to the next thing. And um, and in music, especially in the freelance career, we've all been let go, fired, not asked to come back, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> yep. And yep. that's just part of it. And um, and I think yeah. that when that happens, you know, th- there's rarely hard feelings, and uh, and if there are, they don't really last that long. But yeah, it's business, yeah, yeah and yeah. you know, and I think musicians are hired to be fired, you know, like coaches sometimes because um, there's very few bands that have stayed consistent through they their through their entire careers. Yeah, and those are that's few almost and more rare. Between. Yeah, 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 sure. All right. All that being said, let's get to the the meat of it now. And I think that's a good way to lead up to it, to give a frame yeah. of this kind of uh, how this works. But yeah. so let's go chronological order. Who do we start with? Well, you know, like I said, um, you know, Wayne's first gig was with the Maynard Ferguson big band. Um, him and Joe Zab- and you know, Lat- were actually in the band at the same time. And they would meet uh, uh, 15, uh, 10 or 15 years later to to uh, form with the report, but uh, that was a great big band with the great Frankie Dunlop who, uh, um, who played drums in that band. Um, and 
And Frankie Dunlop is just one of the great big band drummers of history. Um, and uh, uh, like I said, a lot of people know him from Monk's band. Uh, yeah. But he had this really playful, playful approach, um, sort of simplistic, but sort of quirky. Um, I hate the word simplistic, but a little quirky <laughs> and um, was just this fantastic drum, drummer, drummer that every jazz drummer, I think, has to really know. Um, yeah. And uh, that was the first professional that Wayne Shorter worked with. And uh, and then Wayne went on, and 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 Frankie went on, and Joe Zawinul also went on. So that's so that's fifty nine. That's 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 before Blakey. Um, wow. And then you know, and then also in fifty nine, you know, Wayne got Wayne got his chance to be a lead leader, and um, on I believe his first record as a leader called Introdu- uh, called Introducing Wayne Shorter. He plays with Jim, he plays with Jimmy Cobb. And and they sounded and, and no one ever really puts those two guys uh, together because they didn't interact or intersect in Miles's band, but 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 uh, but Wayne and Jimmy Cobb sounded unbelievable together. Uh, uh, Wayne also um, would would record again with uh, with Jimmy Cobb with Bobby Timmons. Hmm. in i'm not sure which year i could look it up but it was also the 60s and um and and that was the second time he recorded with jim e cobb which is an interesting study because we all sort of think of wayne as playing with these you know fantastically busy drummers like elvin and tony and all the guys he would play with in weather report but he but when wayne was playing with jim e cobb it um I mean, it was just, I mean, it was magic, you know, mm-hmm. and, and, and there's two fantastic uh, recordings of that. Um, what are those recordings? I feel like it's good to kind of, if you have the names, yes, so um, people can kind of do a little sure, homework on their own. Sure. The, um, the Wayne, uh, the Wayne record was called Introdu- uh, Introducing Wayne Shorter um, yep. in 19, in 1960. And then the record he did with Bob B. Timmons was 1966 um, called uh, and that's okay if you don't yeah, have the name yeah, people can yeah, find it I'm sure yeah, exactly and yeah, yeah so are they in is is this uh, I would assume just because of the time and the these players sure are they, is this very New York centric at this yes, point uh, yes okay yeah they're they're that all makes perfect they're sense. all they're all they're all real only New York centric yeah. jazz jazz yeah recordings wow uh and then with with playing with art blakey that had to be an incredible he, he clearly knows how to like interact with drummers yeah yeah and has and, an appreciation for it yeah and then you know and then in 1960 on 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 wayne's second soul uh, his second solo record called second genesis he hires blakey and um mm. and and it and it looks like that could be around the first time he plays with Blake and he and then he also in 1960 did join the jazz messengers made a string of unbelievably wonderful records with art um um that that can sort of be separated into a few different classifications the um the early ones were sort of you know real inside and just straight the head swinging um and then by the time they got to the end with records like free for all uh you get and stuff like that the front line had gotten a little bit bigger wayne was writing a little bit more and the rhythm section got a little bit looser and a little bit more uh adventuresome if you want to yeah. say say hey, yeah. that word but you know if there's any if there's any drummers who haven't heard the track free for all from the art blakey record free for all it's one of the most exciting uh jazz recordings ever uh mm, that's good blakey to know. blakey and wayne are just all wrapped up in in each other and uh they caught some magic on tape so that's a yeah that's a really unique take i love getting the you kind of need sometimes 
with jazz and any music in general, if you're just digging into something, you need those. Check this song out. Absolutely. I, I mean, there's so much stuff out there. There's so much stuff yeah. out there. It's hard to know where to start. That's why that's why I developed that whole thing about finding a band leader and studying a little bit of yeah. drums that way. Because yeah, really. It, you know, I I I need to come up with a name for that approach. But, you know, maybe yeah. maybe, maybe you or someone else can. Help me devise a name for that, <laughs> yeah. but just but it's really smart. It's it's almost I don't uh, in a weird way. My brain immediately thinks of almost like a like the visual of like a family tree, yeah, almost where it yeah, branches out. Absolutely, uh, but it's a little different. Now, yeah. did you ever get to interview Art Blakey? He died in ninety, so that was kind of before your. No, I got to um, I got to see him twice um, at okay. the end of his life. I got to speak to him uh, speak to him a little bit, but I never ever got to interview him um and uh i i sort i uh, you know i sort of wish i had it, i mean he was yeah. not before my time but he was before my interviewing time that's what i mean so yeah. um yeah, yeah unfortunately i never got to really learn a lot about him but he's an interesting i mean if you can get somebody on that can really talk about art blakey's life i mean well his son i've been trying to get his son uh -huh. uh, i believe takashi on and um it's just scheduling takes can take sometimes it can take uh, a day. Sometimes it can take five years. Yeah, I mean, it's absolutely. You absolutely. know how it goes. So. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So we've got Frankie Dunlop, Jimmy Cobb, Art Blakey. Uh, I believe I'm not missing maybe a few others in there that I'm missing. But wh where do we go from there? Well, you know, um, you know, and then, you know, and then strangely um, on Wayne's third record editing, he uh which is a record called waning moments his third solo a record mm. and he uh he calls upon a chicago drummer named marshall uh named marshall thompson and marshall was actually the singer in the shy lights late okay. later on in his life but he was also a jazz drum 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 drummer. so wow. so along so along the way there are these little I mean, he didn't, Wayne didn't only just play with the cream of the crop, the best <laughs> guys ever, ever, you know, yeah. uh, Marshall, uh, uh, Marshall Thompson went on and on to make a great deal of, of real, of, uh, real good records as a side person, but, uh, he's not one of the, one of the, the names that everyone recognizes in, yeah. in jazz. But that's more realistic because they can't all be, you know, yeah. Jimmy Cobbs and our right, Blakey's. Exactly. And it's exactly. it's suspicious if they are. It's like, where's the normal right. <laughs> everyday right. drummers? Exactly. So, okay. you know, so, so, you know, then, I mean, after several years in Blakey's band, uh, Miles sort of plucks him away from Blakey to, uh, to join the second gr great quintet with her, Herbie Hancock, Ron Carter, Tony Will and uh and wayne and uh and they make that whole string of legendary you know records with tony from from uh, live in berlin to eesp and live at the plug nickel and uh nefertiti and miles smiles etc 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 i think there's yeah. eight i think there's eight of those uh, records all the way up to uh Wayne being included on In a Silent Way and on Bitches Brew. Mm, I believe wow. he's on Bitches Brew. Um, so, Interesting. So, I mean, you could just look and, and there have been a lot of studies done of this, stu um, you know, of that, of the great quintet um, of tone, uh, you know, and drum wise, they've focused on tone, but sure. it's hard to separate that, uh, that, that, that great quintet it's hard to look at tony without looking at ron without looking at herbie without looking at wayne so that's sort of and then of course to look at miles you know yeah but wayne's wayne's in her action with tony in in that group was just was just something else ironically um tony also hired wayne to be on his first record as a leader called spring Okay. Which was, I believe, 1964. I think that was 1964 as well. Wow. Uh, if not 1965. Um, so, so there was a strong, er, there was a really strong bond between Tony and Wayne. Um, I got to talk to Tony a lot about Wayne, and um, there was a strong kinship brotherhood there. They, it seemed that they both really felt music in the same way and uh yeah 
and Tony sure. is Tony, and Tony is Tony. He will, uh, you know, so it doesn't get much higher praise than that. Yeah. No, no, that there's a special bond, and I think it comes with mutual respect of of you know beyond just playing. They yeah. clearly had he he has a connection to uh, rhythm players in some capacity, and not yeah. uh, a man of the people is yeah. typically <laughs> someone that gets along with drummers. And yeah, exactly. Now, Wayne as a composer and um you know the guy putting the notes on the page he clearly has a way of 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 writing things that work with great drummers do you think that he did he in his writing style leave a lot of room for drummers to do what they wanted or was he pretty specific and i want you to do this through looking at wayne's music um um i th- it 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 seems to me that he left a lot of space for a lot of the guys to be themselves, um, which is even more interesting to us as drum um, drummers, because it didn't yep. it, because it didn't seem like he was he was telling guys exactly what to play and exactly how to play. And um, I think he probably learned that from Miles. You know, when Miles would would hire would create a band, he would he he would he would hire guys to be themselves, you know, and then sure. he would let, and then, let, and then let them be themselves. And I think when Wayne did records, I, I think that's, I think that's sort of how he chose musicians. Um, and then just let them be them, you know, yeah, and they're, that, you they're know, the drummer. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and that leads, you know, and then that leads up to this, you know, um, those three 1964 records that, that he made with Elvin, that that's, that's where a lot of drummers start listening to Wayne, you know, um, in 64, he made night dreamer juju and speak no evil with Elvin Mm. that a lot of people consider some of Elvin's greatest work. Um, and, uh, some lead and, you know, and some legendary songs, fee, five, fo, fum, speak no evil, Yes or no, Juju uh, on Night Dreamer. There was a song called Armageddon that Wayne would play throughout his life, um, and and those records are just. I mean, it's small group jazz from the '60s, uh, perfected. Yeah, you know? absolutely. Um, and to hear him playing with Elvin was, you know, was different from hearing him play with Tony. Um, yeah, I was going to say Elvin's got his own. It's a different style, whereas Tony's more. I don't know. Uh, just it's hard to put words to it. Yeah, Fine tuned, to or but Elvin's more like it's pouring out of him, yeah, feeling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so that you know, you know, so that made Wayne play and made those and made those tunes sort of present themselves in different ways. Um, yeah, you know, and then and then and then ironically. Th- the drum drummer during the sixties that Wayne played with the most wasn't El uh, wasn't Elvin or Tony, but was Joe Chambers. Was the great Joe Chambers who was still alive and still playing really great. He's a great composer. I've 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 uh, recorded some of his music and played with him a couple times. Um, but he's on um, he's on uh, a record called Etc. Um, he's on the all seeing eye. He's on Adam's apple, which is a quartet re- re- record. Then he's on a record called schizophrenia. Mm. Um, and they, and, and they were all Wayne records with Joe chambers, you know, Interesting. Um, and Joe Cham- chambers. And the reason I interrupted you there, uh, was oh, yeah. Joe, um, was Joe was sort of, is sort of this unique blend of Tony and Elvin. He had the expansiveness of Elvin, but he had the directness of Tony, but he didn't have the chops of Tony because no yeah. one does. Uh, but Joe <laughs> is this is this real is this really unique sort of combination of both of those guys. And and Wayne and Joe recorded together a lot. And and actually they recorded a lot of the same songs that that Wayne recorded with Elvin or with, uh, with miles with tone. Oh, so, that's um, it's a real, it's a really interesting reductive, uh, sort of way to study, um, Wayne's music by listening to him play these songs with 
Joe Chambers, and then hear him play these songs with Tom Williams as well. These these guys, it's this circle of incredible musicians where uh, I just think it needs to be said that talk about an amazing time in history and an amazing place. New York, obviously, there was different places around the world, but there was something in the air, something in the water that was producing just monster players. And yeah, uh, and yeah there's creativity. Yeah. You couldn't have said you uh, you couldn't have said it better. There, there, there was. I mean, it was the '60s. It was the mid '60s. It was a great time for art, and and it was a turbulent time, civil rights, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Um, and and no doubt that helped uh, create some wonderful art. Um, but yeah, it was it was a um, it was a unique time. But as strange as it is, there's, you know, I mean. The early '90s was the same way, um, and and as mm. and for as much as people talk about how bad '70s jazz was, there was a lot of great jazz um, recorded and bands playing in the '70s as well. So, yeah, you know, I um, for some reason a lot a lot of that mid '60s stuff has 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 has, 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 has risen to stuff of legend. Um, sure. And and that's not to take anything away from it. But um, yeah, yeah, it was a unique time. Let's talk about while we're going, we'll stay on the timeline here. But was Wayne performing? Would he be recording and then also touring and playing live with the same drummer he was using or would he switch around? Well, that's an interesting thing, because because Wayne didn't work much as a band leader throughout his whole life. Um, A lot of um, um, it. when he put together his his last quartet with Brian Blade, uh, that was the first time he had had a working jazz group that toured under Wayne's name for oh, wow. a long amount of time. Actually, we can go backwards, and the uh, and um, one of the only other times before that was he toured with sort of a fusion band in the eighties with Tom Breckline. You know, and Gary Willis was playing bass, and I forget who. Uh, oh, and Mitch Foreman played uh, played uh, played keyboards. But I talked to Tom oh. a lot, a lot about that, and that was one of the first times that Wayne had brought a band on the road under his own name. Now uh, he did do, you know, I mean, he did do gigs around town. Yeah, um, sure, but. From what from what I've been able to learn through talking to guys and some re and some research as far as having a working band, you know, he didn't have you know he 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 was too busy with first with Blakey and then with Miles and then with Web Report um, to 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 have his own working band. So fortunately, we have the records um, of yeah. him do- of of him documenting all of his all of his great music and all of these great interactions with these great drum um, yeah. as well. You know, I just got to say that in, you, you don't take it for granted that obviously this is your job, but your memory of all of these individual, everyone on every instrument on every album is pretty incredible. I mean, obviously you do this for, you know, a lot with your job, but uh, I don't have that with my, <laughs> I don't work like that. It's pretty impressive. You know, I'll, you know, you know, I'll throw, you know, I'll throw something else. Um, in here, this is uh, this has been one of my more recent uh, things I've been pounding on. Um, I interviewed the great Terry Clark, uh, drum drum drummer from Canada, several years ago, and uh, love his playing with Jim Hall and stuff like that. And and mm-hmm. terror and terror, he doesn't have anything to do with the Wayne Shorter thing. But we sure. were talk, but we were talking, and and uh, we were talking, and we were talking about students. And, and, and he said it perfectly. And I've been spouting his words since, um, that when he was young and when I was young and when you were young, and this is not for, for us to sound like the old guys, but we allowed ourselves to become obsessed with things. Um, and I, I just don't know if people are allowing themselves these days to be obsessed with things. Uh, it, in fact, obsessed takes on this sort of bad bad shape you know um yeah and and there's great obsessions and and i think and the wonderful thing about let let it in younger guys be obsessed with baseball cards sports whatever 
they choose to be obsessed by is once you learn how to educationally be obsessed with something, you can apply it to any other uh, thing you you become obsessed with. And yeah. uh, I became obsessed with music at a really young age with recordings and with practicing and with playing in bands. And um, yeah, it's, it's just an obsession yeah. and I've been lucky enough to make, make a living at it for, oh, for, for a decent amount of time. Oh yeah. I love that. I mean, I am, uh, if you're listening to this show, you're probably obsessed with the drums. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, hopefully I'm obsessed. Ho- you're obsessed. Yeah. We're all obsessed. Yeah. 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 That's awesome. I'm so glad I prompted you to say that because like or or with that question, because I've never heard uh, that's such a good way to put it. All right. So getting back on here. So we we were at Joe Chambers. Um, Where do we go from there? Well, so then so then like the lead up, you know, um, sort uh, sort of after Wayne leaves Miles's band, he's still recording on his own a lot. Um, There is a record called Supernova um that jack dejanet is on chick korea all, also plays on that drums and uh, plays drums on that recording one of the only recordings that chick plays drums on um mm-hmm. and um and then and then and then eventually there's a record called the odyssey of iska which is alphonse muzan and so we have yeah. all these late fusion niche records jazz rock fusion if whatever you want to call all them uh, recordings that that are leading us step by step in very small ways to weather report, um, and 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 amazingly, um, three guys seem to always be intersecting in very unique ways, and those three guys are are Wayne Shorter and Joe Zawinul and bassist Miroslav Vitos, um, hmm. and Miroslav is on. A Wayne Shorter record. Miroslav is on a Joe Zawinul recording. Joe and Wayne were in were in weather were in uh, main, in Ferguson's band together, and those three eventually, you know, create Weather Report. Um, but um, but the record uh, but the record Supernova is Jack, um, and then and then there's a really obscure record called Moto Grosso Feo. Who mm. is who? Uh, who Jack plays? Uh, Jack plays on that record a little bit, but there's a uh, from what I've learned, a Brazilian drummer named Michelin Peltzer uh, listed on the record as as uh, Michelin Prell. Looks like the only record that I, I mm-hmm. I'm not sure if it's a man or woman has ever done is the record wow. that they did with Wayne in 1970 album to do yeah right exactly exactly so wayne is just not just not only playing with jack and 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 alphonse and joe you know he finds a michelin peltzer or prell and and puts them on this great uh record called modo grace modo grosso feo yeah you wonder how that happened was it maybe yeah. moto who, whoever they were were just playing in like a bar or something or, yeah. or just yeah and like, you know and that and that does happen throughout music history you run yeah. across these weird little one-offs you know? yeah but jack dejanet as i'm quickly kind of googling as we go yeah. along he was performing with him as well right the, another legend yeah i mean jack the le- you know a li- you know a living legend of legends um yeah. and and jack had a had uh jack had played with wayne in the last incarnation of the miles quintet uh, what they refer to now as the Lost Quintet because they never officially recorded it, but they toured a lot, which was Wayne and Jack DeJanet and Dave Holland and Chick Corea and Miles, uh, known known as the, the uh, Lost Quintet, and they played together there a lot. So, so uh, Jack and Wayne went on from that to play with the each other a good deal on a couple of on a couple of Waynes. Yeah. records so this whole part of wayne's career seems to be pointing towards what seems to be pointing towards weather report and um and then what the, the report happens in 1970 uh the first weather the report drummer is alphonse muzan 
Um, yep. And if you're a YouTube guy, there's a great, uh, there's a DVD recording of, of, of it, but there's also a great uh, recording, I'm sure, on, I'm sure on YouTube of 1971 in Germany of Weather the Report playing and Alphonse is playing a little Gretsch kit and boy, he sounds like Tony. And yeah. it, it doesn't get higher praise from me than that. Uh, yeah. But, but no, Alphonse is, is one of the is one of the forgotten legends of of drums and maybe forgotten is a strong term, but uh, I, overlooked. I don't. Yes, exactly. I agree. And, and, and he sticks in my mind. I've seen those videos of he's got just you can just tell. And it's you know, it might be silly to say, but his his aesthetic, his style with the hat and the yeah. white kind of jumper like you know Absolutely. 70s look Think, things are changing we're not wearing suits anymore you yeah know? <laughs> yeah right exactly exactly so so he's in so he's in the first web report along with Erto, uh is playing percussion as well and and then where the reports a band and and we get this and we get the start of this great web the report band that um for drummers is this wonderful band that changed drummers every couple years, every few years for a long time. And they had some of the greatest drummers come through that band ever. The guy yeah. that, that came in after all, um, after Alphonse moves on was Eric Gravatt, um, uh, who is one of my favorites. I've, um, I've interviewed him and, and talked to him a few times and know him well. Um, and he did this. Um, he was on a record called "Live in Tokyo," uh, mm. that was only released at the time in Japan. Um, and now, you know, one of the wonders of the internet, you can find this stuff everywhere. Yeah. Just you know, just by going to to uh, to Amazon or something like that. But live in but live in Tokyo is this wonderful record that that Eric Gravatt and the West of Re- and the rest of the Weather Report band. They're just painting. They're just painting <laughs> soundscapes, and that's awesome. Uh, and there's a great vid- video of that band. Um, uh, it was released on a uh, on a DVD called Mor- called Morning Lake, I think. But that's 1972. It's a black and white film, and and Eric Gravatt is mm. just tearing it up. Uh, that's awesome. Worth, I'm not as familiar with him as I probably should be. He and um, uh, he was in he was in a McCoy Tyner's band at the same time that Alphonse Mizan was in Weather Report, and they flip flop. and And Alphonse Mizan uh, Mizan joined uh, joined a McCoy Tyner's band, and Eric Gravatt went to Weather Report. Uh, Interesting. Um, Eric Gravatt is also on a great uh, McCoy Tyner record called Focal Point. Forget about it. Uh, you know, uh, he <laughs> yeah. is he is another one of the sort of un, un, unsung greats. Yeah. Um, the strange thing after that was things things got a little, you know, I think a little strange and wet the report. Some people wanted it to get a little funkier. Some people wanted to continue painting, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I think there was some um, there was uh, some confusion in the leadership of the band between them three, but um, the drum um, uh, the drummer that came in after Eric Gravatt was a drummer who was playing in Sly and the Family Stone, Greg Arico. Hmm. Uh, now there's now he's the first guy that I'll mention here that there's no official recordings of. You have to go okay. to the bootleg world and find those, but there's lots of them um, yeah. of recordings in 1973 with Web the Report with the great Gregory Eco, who came directly from Sly and the Family Stone to Web the Report and uh, turned the whole sound sort of sideways. It turned into a funkier thing. And uh, was equally just as exciting. And Greg, um, I interviewed Greg years ago uh, for the magazine Stick It. Um, and Greg talked about his time and whether the report was on a couple months as like the musical highlight of his life. Yeah, that's you a know, big deal. I remember and, seeing him in the Quest Love documentary about God. I'm gonna. I don't want to mess up the name. It was the concert in New York. It was uh, yeah, I, yeah. Sounds of Summer. I forget what the name of it was. I'll put that in the yeah, description or something. Yeah, but yeah. with him performing with Sly, and I was like, man, that guy's good. And it yeah. made me look him up, and, yeah. and then I learned. 
Yeah. 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 And he he was in one the report for a couple for a brief little a, a brief little stint. Um there was also a drummer in what report for a brief little time there named by the name of Herschel Dwellingham, who um who I can't tell you that much about. I ran into him mm. in Alabama, actually, strangely enough, playing in a club, and I spoke to him uh briefly. But um there's, Interesting. There's not a whole lot to be said about that. Um, yeah. And then, you know, you know, you know, and then in comes Ndugu Chancellor. Well, well, actually, well, actually, uh, before that, there was um, there was a drummer named Ishmael Wilburn, uh, who was on the Mysterious Traveler, uh, Mysterious Traveler record. And and a really unique thing about the Mysterious Traveler record is is that Joe Zout and you'll also uh, put Skip Haddon on that record. Um, Skip told me that Joe had heard him playing with an organ group out in Ohio, I think somewhere, and um, and wanted him to come and sort of play back background drums. You know, while the rest of the band was playing, you know, Skip just sort of painted colors in the background. And uh, That's cool. I think he's on two or three tracks on mysterious traveler if i'm if i'm remembering correctly so then what so then what the report goes on and on and on and do go chancellor uh does does a record called tail spinning uh and you know uh incredible legend i mean yeah legend yeah. you know and was also late in the late Neron, uh, Car- uh, Carlos Santana and, and Wayne Shorter co-led the band, which Indugu played in and toured with. Oh, wow. So, so that, yeah. you know, so, uh, Indugu didn't go on the road that much. So for him, so for him to go out with, with Wayne and Carlos was, I'm sure a pretty big deal. Yeah. For him. It's yeah. a special group. To, yeah. I mean, th- there's certain situations where you're like, yeah, I'll go out with you. Yeah, right. Exactly. Because <laughs> at that point, these these guys could make enough just playing on sessions right, and just doing exactly. making albums that right, right, I guess you exactly. wouldn't need to. Yeah. And then, you know, you know, and then Wayne does sort of a um, sort of sort of a left turn and records a record called Native Dancer, which was a Brazilian record. And the strange thing was. Before then, there were a couple of records that he had done Milton Milton Nascimento tunes and um, and some Jobim tunes and um, and he does a record with Milton Nascimento called Native Dancer with the great drum the great Brazilian drummer uh, Robertinho Silva. So that's 1975, where we're at now, yeah. ish. In this, and, yep. Yep. And he was born in 1933. So at this point, this prolific of a career, he was like 42 years He's old. He's 42 so, years old. Yeah. A young guy, it really, with this amount of musical history. Right. We and we incredible. haven't even gotten to 1980 yet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Exactly. And he passed away, uh, like. 18 when we're recording this like 18 days ago i yeah. think if i'm not yeah. mistaken yeah i mean cha- i you know i challenge you know i challenge somebody else out there to find another musician who's played with as many of the greats as Wayne yeah. had you know and yeah. we're only to 1974 you know i'm not sure how much time we have left here but uh <laughs> but we're on we're only in 1974 so we better yeah. jump on things here sure sure well, so what you know so when the report goes on, you know, of course, um, you know, of course, if um, in nineteen eighty uh, seventy nine, Erskine, um, Erskine joins a band. But before then, of course, there's Chester Tom, Tom there's uh, Chester Thompson and Indu and um, and Martin and Michael Walden on Black mm-hmm. Market. There's um there's Al Acuna on heavy weather uh, the, the, the the yeah the love the, him. one of the most you know revered fusion records of all time I probably shouldn't have to tell many people about that record that's where yeah or those two records are when Jocko hits the mix and and what the, the report takes on a little bit of a different thing event you know and then Erskine Erskine's in what the report I believe for longer than anyone else had been. 
Mm. Um, I talked to, um, for the legends thing that I wrote for, uh, that I wrote for MD, I bugged Peter a lot about Wayne and, and, and Joe's out and you'll, and what that band was like. Um, and I got some really interesting stuff from him, but Peter also wrote this great book called no Beethoven that he details his whole a career and details the what the report stuff at, you know, very closely. That's a fantastic book. Uh, yeah, that we should all. Read. I haven't read it, but I've. It's been discussed on the show about the impact of how cool the digital format was when it came out. With all of the, it was like very forward yeah. thinking and progressive with yep. what you could do with a ebook, basically. Yep. Yeah. Well, yep. that's Peter. Yeah. Yeah. Pete, he, Pete, he, there's a very forward thinking guy. Sure. Um. So you know. So then there's the Erskine. Erskine Jocko weather the report years that Wayne is Wayne is a big partner of. Um and then eventually they get to um well and actually when Pete they first joined the band, uh there was a um um or when Peter was I forget. Um but there's a record called Mr. Gone that Steve Gadd play plays on and Tony Williams plays on and Pete they're wow. all, all and Peter also plays on, so there's there's another one of the uh, greats, you know. I mean, it's everyone. It's yeah, like, yeah, it's incredible. Yeah, it's, it's you know, Wayne's like the where's wall, the where's Waldo of drumming. You know, yeah. find somebody else. He sign somebody as he he hasn't played with. Um, yeah. So then, weather report goes on and on and on. Um, uh, Omar Hakim is of course in the last incarnation of weather report with uh with victor bale oh, oh, bale and stuff like that they do that great record uh dom and o theory sport and life and um procession um so there's omar there's a great omar hakeem you can check another yeah. one guy you know on the, the <laughs> yeah. guy off team list um yeah. when um when wayne starts to do his solo records uh, back, you know, you know, after what the, the report goes along for a while. And then Wayne, uh, does a record called Atlantis in 1985, Ralph Humphrey and Al and Al Acuna again. Yeah. So he's pulling again. from his, uh, weather report friends there. Yeah, obviously. he's pulling. Yeah, exactly. And then next in 86 was a record called Phantom Navigator that Tom Breckline is on. This is the band. This is the quartet that toured for, from what I have been told, the first time Wayne took a band out on his own. They toured, mm. uh, they toured as a quartet. There's some footage of that band out there. Tom Breckline just lighting it up, sounding unbelievably fantastic. He's on, yeah. I think he's only on one or two tracks of Phantom, Nav of, of Phantom Navigator and the rest is programmed. Um, oh, and, interesting. And, uh, and then you know, and and then in eight, and then in eight, eight, eight uh, Wayne did a record called Joy Rider with the uh, Terry Lynn Carrington play in drums, and Terry wow. Lynn and Wayne have a long-standing relationship throughout the rest of Wayne's life. Uh, she's on the last record he did called Live at the Detroit Jazz Festival, which was just released last year with Terry Lynn and Esperanza F Spalding and Leo Hen of Ise, uh playing mm. piano. I don't no, know. No. So, so, I mean, she, she started a playing relationship with him in 88 and it went to last year. So that's about as long as it gets. Wow. You know? She's incredible. And she would, I mean, she would have to be pretty darn young at that point um, yeah. to be hanging with these guys. She's a natural talent and it's cool to see, a female musician in the mix here because uh you know it's in that jazz world it's a lot of guys we all yeah. know that so she yeah. really stands out yeah yeah and she she uh she sounds great on that record that's 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 sort of one of those lost lost wayne shorter a record set because for a while he was recured uh he was releasing a great deal of records and some sort of get forgotten in the yeah the sands of time yeah um you know, as I'm quickly kind of just jumping around, clicking on yeah. Wikipedia as we talk, I, I just I've never noticed or heard this. 
Terry Lynn Carrington at the age of 11 received a full scholarship to Berkeley College of Music. Yep. Yeah, she yeah. Yeah, well um Wow. Oh, like I said, she's uh she's on the cover of MD in April. Uh we Oh yeah, did, very topical. Uh we did uh I did a real oh, nice interview with her right before the Grant Mays. She just won she just won the um the jazz record of the year grant memory or something like that. And it's actually the second time she's won it. And it's actually the second drummer who has ever gotten record of the year jazz record of the year. The only other one was Art Blakey. Oh man. And she's done Whoa. it twice. So that's pretty, <laughs> that's really substantial. You know, it's good for all of us. That's good for all of us. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Ab- right. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, yeah. A drum, uh, a drummer led, record getting jazz record of the year that that's great for all of us absolutely yeah, it makes us all look good <laughs> yeah absolutely yeah absolutely so wayne so wayne after that uh he toured with the santan a shorter band for a little while with indugo there's a lot of really great videos of that um there's a really good one at the montro jazz festival i don't think i don't know how long that band survived but um but they toured once and they recorded it a bit. Wayne had been on um, a Santana uh, a Santana record called "The Swing of Delight," with uh, where he played with Harv where he played with Harvey Mason. Check oh, another man. one off. You know yeah, the great Harvey seriously he ma- a- a- Mason and uh, and he was also on a, on a couple tunes on that record with Tony Williams as well. Mm. Um, so then again, you know, you know, check another one of the greats off. Um, yeah. then it sort of seems like Wayne, for some reason, sort of takes a break and I don't know why, but you know, a well-deserved break because we're now up to 1988 or something like that. And he had been r- recording and, and playing straight through since 1959. So he, <laughs> you know, he deserved a, a little, yeah, he, yeah, he, he deserved a little bit, uh, a little bit of a break. He comes yeah. back in 1995 with a record called High Life, which uh, is this sort of large group thing with Will Calhoun from Living Color. Wow, that's cool. Playing drums. And it's a fantastic record uh, that was overlooked at the time by lots of people, including myself. Um, but um, just compositionally, arrangement wise, doesn't get much better than that record um i i also had the, the good for urchin of playing with a guitar player named david gilmore not not the guy from pink floyd but the guy from new york <laughs> um and he was in wayne's wayne's band at the time he was also in treat lot gertu's band at the time and oh, cool. uh and i did a record with da- and david david was on my first re- uh, record that i released under my own name but of course in the rehearsals and when we did gigs i would do nothing but bug him about Wayne Shorter. Shorter. Yeah, and, totally. Uh, and one of the interesting things he told me about Wayne is that when they did that record, and Will and Will also told me the same thing, that Wayne presented the band with like orchestral scores, you know, and said like, "Here's the music." These guys <laughs> are looking at like ten lines of music, but no chord symbols or no nothing like that, and they've got to and they had to read the and they had to read that stuff. So that's how Please. that's that's the scope of that record. High, High High Life is still one of my one of the records I one uh, one of the records I will listen to that just repeatedly puts a smile on my face when I talk to Will about that when I, when uh, when I interviewed Will for the Percussive Arts Society several years ago about that record. Um, I said to him, I said, I I don't know how you're going to take this, but you're on one of my favorite records of all time. And I, and I forgot that you were even on it. <laughs> you know, you know, I said, and it's not a record that I love for what you played or, and, or anything like that. I just love the record and you happen to be on, on it. And he looked oh, at me and said, I completely understand. You know, yeah. he said, you have to be talking about the Wayne record. And I said, yeah, you know, and, yeah. and at times mm. I forget that, that you're even on that re- record. And he said, I sometimes forgot I was even on, I was even on that. It's <laughs> funny. So. It's not about the drummer, oh, really. I mean, it's, it's not. It's it's not. Yeah. And yet he plays he plays his butt off. He's gro- he's grooving hard on that record. Ter- 
Relin is also on a couple tracks on that record as well. And man, he just lays it down and just sounds utterly fantastic. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, let me ask, and I know we, there's, there's still more to go. And yeah, this is, yeah. We can talk forever, but, but let me just ask you, like, does, does this sort of uh, affinity he has for using incredible drummers, does that also translate to he's also using incredible bassists on each album? Is every musician the best in class? I, um, well, I mean, you know, I mean, you look at the I mean, you look at the bass players in Weather Report and and although they had a million drummers, there was only really four. There's only really four a basis in the band. It went from Miroslav to Alfonso Johnson to Jocko to Victor Bailey. There's four yeah. of the greats. There's four of the greats yeah. right there. So um, uh, I he 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 had a great I mean, he was he was associating with a different crowd um he's associating with the greats so he had yeah. access to the great i mean um um on that record uh marcus miller's on that record and does a lot of orchestration on on that record as well mm. but but also drum but also musicians like jim beard um played with him for a long time and then and then you know and then when they toured from that band, when, when they toured that re uh that record although they although he did the first part of the first tour with will calhoun um rodney holmes joined wayne short there's yeah. been for a long time uh i think before he was in santa i don't know and they played all of the music from high, high life and rodney holmes wasn't you know, a, a, a big, huge name, but Rodney Holmes played that music unbelievably well. Yeah. So, yeah. So I think I, I, Wayne just has this wonderful ear for drummers. Yeah, know? he does. It's like an affinity. I mean, he's got his finger on the pulse of he's like, got, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. He, okay. Good so, answer. Yeah. I, I, yeah. It's tough to tell, but he, um, sure. yeah, he, I mean, he definitely, um had access to all of the greats but he sometimes would um you know would would hire guys that not a whole lot of people knew about you know like mm. you know like rodney you yeah. know trust your gut yeah trust your gut so um so then oh and there's also a, and, and there's also a really good dvd out of of the band with rodney at the Montreal jazz festival in 1996 um, you cool. can hear, you can hear Rodney playing this music sounding unbelievable. Um, and then, and then in 2001, 2000, 2001 is when Wayne put together, you know, uh, what a lot of people called at the time, like his first working jazz group, you know, at, I don't know how old he would have been in 2000, but that's yeah. how long it took to, for him to put together a working jazz group with Brian Blade and John Petucci and uh, Daniel Perez and they release a series of unbelievably great records that I think went above a lot of people's heads because like like the weather report 1972 live in Tokyo stuff they were just sort of painting and yeah um and uh it might not have been some of the most listener friendly music but boy yeah, it was fantastic. So you know, in two thousand two, it's different than in nineteen seventy or whatever. Yeah, you right. know, with the the taste of the right, uh, this whatever individuals right. listening. Right, yeah. and but that's uh, awesome. Yeah, and Ter you know, and Terry Lynn sort of played and subbed in that band a little while as well. There was also a drummer by the name of Jonathan Pinson, who's who was a student of of uh, Terry Lynn's who subbed in that band for Brian a little while. I interviewed him last year. Um, you know, a great drummer from the West Coast uh, who played with Wayne at that point. Um, and they do Footprints live. I think a lot of people refer to this quartet as the Footprints Quartet. And mm. they and they do Al Agria or Allegria, I'm not sure. Uh, sure. Beyond, uh, beyond the Sound Barrier, which is a live red record without a net uh m anon and then the last one live in detroit uh with terry lynn so those last 23 years or so is all brian blade and terry 
Elin, which is which is a wonderful thing. Unbelievable. I I, I knew going into this that it was going to be. I was uh, I was expecting some of the big names, but it's it's every big name of every decade. Yeah. Uh, it, it's like the who's who, which which these drummers would obviously be playing with other people. They of were they were kind of doing all kinds of things. But um, my God, I mean, it's it's the, more than I expected. And the and the amazing thing is, um, when I got to in, in interview each of these guys, and I've interviewed most of them, I would always sort of ask them about working with Wayne, and uh, it get a special look in their eye and say, Wayne, you know, I got to work with Wayne, you know, (laughs) and, and, you know, and, you know, and this goes on into the eighties. I mean, he's on a lot of Joan Mitchell records where he plays with Vinny. He plays with Jim Keltner, plays with Carlos Vega, plays with the great, uh, the great John Gurren, you know? Um, and I remember talking to, I remember, talking to Vinny about playing with Wayne and and Vinny from what I remember was trying to get Wayne to do his first record and it, it didn't sort of work out but you know I mean Vinny put Wayne on this pedestal you know and uh and then he got to work with him on Herbie's River record um mm. with uh, with all you know with her being Dave Hall and and and, and uh, Vinny and Wayne yeah I mean, the list goes on and on and on. In 1964, he does a side mandate with Lee Moore with Lee Moore Ergen that Bill the Higgins is on a great record called "The Procrastinator." Nice. Uh, and him and Bill and him and Bill Lee really sort of mix it up. Um, mm. He's on, I think, I, I think it's six or seven Joan e. Mitchell records. That world of going out of his own kind of jazz world, which you touched on at the beginning of getting to play on like film soundtracks and things yeah. like that, that opens you up into even further yeah. musicians on those tracks, which are always, you know, incredible musicians. So yeah. yeah, it's, it's just amazing. It almost makes you think that he, you know, at some level, his, you know, pers- personality and everything might be at the core of getting all these, these incredible musicians together yeah. and making them who they are um, to some degree where it, and living to be 89 years old, uh, yeah. I mean, Roy Haynes is still going at, I think he just turned 98 or something, yeah. 99 years old. So there's yeah. some of these jazz greats are really getting up there in age, but uh, it, it, he, it's incredible. Wayne Shorter, though, it says on, on here on Wikipedia, I'm sure things are missed, but I mean, he's got every award you could imagine, like Grammy Lifetime oh. Achievement Awards, Kennedy Center Awards. Clearly a very well-respected guy who is uh, clearly going to be missed, but... When you're 89, it's not like he didn't pass yeah. away at 40 years right, old, and exactly. it's a tragedy. He lived a great life. Exactly. Some some of the last great records he did was was on Joan E. Mitchell's. Uh, uh, she did two large group records. A record called Travelog with Brian and Blade in 2002, and in 2000, a record called Both Sides Now with Erskine and and mm. uh, and Wayne was a featured soloist on both of those. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, you know, it just goes on and on and on and on and on playing with a Procaro on, 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 uh, Glengarry Glenn Ross, you know, and I, and I read, I read somewhere about Jeff talking about that session that he was just, he was, he, he was just geek that he got to play with Wayne Shorter. You know, that's incredible. So yeah, it's just, you know, he's, he, he's a thread that connects, Art Blakey and Frankie Dunlop to Vinny, Carlos Vega and Jeff Procaro. Find another thread. You know, you know, there's that old, you know, the the six degrees of Kevin Bacon <laughs> yeah, you you know, thing. Read my yeah. mind. I was just about to say that. <laughs> Find another musician that connects Frankie Dunlop and Vinny Colayuda. Yeah. Good luck. It's good uh, luck. Man, I it's so cool. It's an incredible. Someone needs to make a visual aid to see all these things and how they're connected. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And then th- and then throw in wild cards like Greg Rico and Dugu. Of course, and Dugu played with everybody, so that wouldn't be hard. But yeah, you yeah. know, it's 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 you know, like your broadcast is called. You know, the drum. You know, the drum history thing. Music history is drum history, and uh, and Wayne is music history. And Wayne 
is also drum history. And, yeah. and if you're, and if you're tuned in enough, I guess, to sort of, you know, to sort of note is that you don't have to look for anything else. It's all yeah. right there. It's all right yeah. there. Just, you know, just pay attention to Wayne. I also spent a great deal of time playing Wayne Shorter solos and Wayne Shorter, you know, heads on the drums, you know, yeah. you know, just sort of taking his sort of taking his wonderful compositions like Juju and Speak No Evil and stuff like and orchestrating them around the drums in, in, in the same way that Max did with bird heads, yeah. you know, and bird licks and Roy Haynes did with bird licks. You know, I think I think the next I think the next step was to do that with Roy uh, to uh, to do that with Wayne Shorter solos and and compositions. I spent a lot of time transcribing to the best of, that I could, and I'm not published on them nowhere. <laughs> but uh, you know, Wayne's Wayne solos on some of those Miles on some of those Miles records, and then trying to orchestrate them around the drums. That's cool to hear the rhythm, because if you move it from one instrument to another, it's yeah. still going to be it's it has that special sauce that only he had. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. yeah. So he's 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 that he's that special of a guy. Uh, he's that special of a musician. He's not the only one. You know, I just wrote, you know, um, I actually just wrote the um, my editor's overview from Modern Drummer for the April uh edition and i called it al i called it alan chick edward jeff and wayne and it's for hallsworth chickery and and, and and edward van Halen and jeff beck and and wayne shorter and just yeah. sort of it, it sort of goes back to that thing i was saying about how great drumming lives within great music and those guys provided the great music for so much great drumming to live inside of and yes. uh we yes. should all be whether whether we're fans of those guys or not i'm not telling people what music to listen to but the music that jeff beck created and and chick created and stuff like that i mean it made so much great drumming possible people don't go out and just listen to if no matter the best drummer in the world pop culture is not going to go out and just listen to a drummer playing you need the framework of eddie van halen or something like that playing yes. to then yeah. Yeah, give them the the dose of Alex Van Halen yeah, or, or exactly. any other great musician he played right, with. Exactly, but, exactly. Man. And and yeah. Eddie, you know, now uh, now obviously Ed Ed really only did that for Al, you know. But yeah. all of the other guys on that list created the. Um, I think in the in the MD piece, I said like they let all these great drummers play in their sandbox, you know, and create yeah. this great music yes. and. Uh, we should all be forever in debt, you know, in debt and ended. Because if you want to look at all of the great music that Jeff Beck created for drum drum drummers from Blow by Blow and Bex Bolero, you know, and Bucks a Bolero through the stuff with Vin and, and Nard and stuff like that, it's all Jeff Beck's music. And yeah. um and he was smart enough and giving enough to share that music with some of the great drummers of all time. And so it was Wayne. And, yeah. uh, yes. Well, that, then, okay. So to, to kind of wrap things up, I just yeah. want to say that this, this is a very, like when I looked at the, the, like if someone sends me a message and says, Oh, do an episode on the drummers of Zappa. I look at that and I go, all right, I don't know. You know, how do I find the, the right person for it? The most connected, but having you kind of come up with this idea it's not an easy episode to tackle, but I just got to say to you, you just made that entire thing seem effortless because you're passionate about it. It's something you care about. And, and, and truly for, for me to go through and, and do all the research and everything, it would take, I mean, it's almost a lifetime's worth of work with, with you enjoying this music and everything, but very well done. I mean, to, to go through each album and, and interconnect it all. Uh, I am first off very impressed. It'd be fun to do more with you down the road. We can do whatever we can do whatever ever you want. You don't have to you don't have to prod me to get me to talk about <laughs> drums, you know. And um, you know, and I'm lucky enough that through, you know, that through modern drum uh, drum mummer and through my students, you know, I have uh, I have a lot of time to talk about drums and a yeah. lot of time to think about drums 
and talk to other drummers about drums, both famous and old and and not famous and young who are trying to learn stuff. I've got students all over the world and uh, I'm lucky. I get to do yeah. this a lot. You know, I get We're to talk obsessed. about drumming. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I get to talk about drummers and drumming a lot. And, uh, and then I get to play a lot. So, yeah. Hey, you know, I tell people all the time, I'm one of the luckiest guys in the world. Absolutely. Everyone's going to enjoy hearing about it as well. And I think the the big thing too, I know for me, I've learned and I have a lot of things written down, but honestly, the list of I was trying to keep up with the names of drummers and really it just turns into it's all of them. I mean, literally uh, yeah. every famous drummer you could imagine, but um, yeah. a lot of songs that uh, and and albums and things for people to check out. Um, so that's a great service just to tell, you know, give a give a little heads up on the particular ones. Yeah, there on. there he you know, he wrote some jazz standards that, uh, you know, there are. There are standards and there's jazz standards. The standards come from, you know, the great American songbook, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But, sure. but Wayne wrote a great deal of songs that are jazz standards that you should probably know if you're going to call yourself a jazz musician. You better, you, you better be familiar with Speak No Evil and uh, Juju and, you know, and songs like that. And the great thing about Wayne is he 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 played a lot of these songs throughout his career. Um, yeah. You know, in a lot of different contexts, he played a lot of that stuff with the band with Brian Blade, uh, and he recorded a lot of that a lot of that music with El Oven and with Joe Chambers, and then he played it in Miles's band. So, mm. I mean, just think about that. You could hear the same song played with the composer, but being played by Elvin. Joe Chambers, Tony Williams, Brian and Blade. And in some context, uh, Terry Lynn and maybe even Vinny on 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 that Herbie record or something. Wow. That's Amazing a pretty to think I about mean, that. Yeah, just yeah. take one song. Just you know, just find the one song that they all recorded and just do that. Yeah. That's pretty yeah. special. And Erskine. And put me yeah. in there in in there as well so that that's there i mean there's some great books out there there's some great guys writing fantastic books and methods and systems and stuff like that but i'm always a little reluctant to take music out of drumming and or, or to i'm sorry to take drumming out of music and to take sure. a mu and to take a musical viewpoint of great drum drum i mean and to study the within the history of great music that really just speaks to me. Yeah. Yeah. Very interesting. Uh, it's a cool way to do it. I mean, and I think people are taking the first step right now by listening to this episode and hearing more about it. Yeah. Um, so like I said, very well done. Love to have you back on. Uh, Mark, as we Whatever. wrap up, is there anywhere you want to like tell people to find you on social media or a website or MD in general or what? <laughs> uh, I, I, um, I, unfortunately, I don't have a, a website. Um, I, I I don't have time for social media. Um, you don't need it. <laughs> yeah, I, I you know I'm working hundred hour weeks here uh, between yeah. between students and MD and gigs. So it, you know I, I I I I really don't have that much time for that. But yeah, um, people subscribe can always, to Modern Drummer. <laughs> people can always, oh, oh, always contact me through MD and um and I'll and I'll uh, respond because I try to respond to every, to every message that I get. And yep. um, I don't know if I mentioned it, but I work on the legends, uh, the legends book that I did with uh, the legend books that I did with MD. Um, yep. The, the first one was the Dan, uh, the first one was the Dan, uh, the Dan, he said, book. The second one was the Ken Ernoff book, uh, the Peter Erskine book and the Steve Smith book all really worthwhile uh drum studies in those specific guys um we uh we worked a long time and real hard on those and uh i put my name next to those i put i put my i'm uh, my name next to everything i do for md so uh yeah but those legends things are worthwhile dives in to all, all those guys and you can sort of get a little bit of the sense of how my mind works from yeah from how those legends things are laid out 
with the transcriptions and with guys talking about their transcriptions and stuff like that. So, yeah, very yeah. cool. Incredible. Thank you to Bob Catigliotti for uh, connecting us. Uh, Bob is a good guy and very, you know, just a, I love when people connect, you know, me to people who are a great fit for the show. And this worked out perfectly. So, uh, Mark, thank you for being here and spending all this time sharing the uh, legendary life and drummers of Wayne Shorter with all of us. Thanks, man.